Part 1 You will hear someone being asked their opinion of a new television station. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, but would you have time to answer a few questions? Uh, what's it about? We're doing some market research for a new television channel starting in two years' time. Uh, OK, why not? Lovely. We'll just work through this form. And if we could start with some personal background information? Sure. Right. If I could just have your age? 35. Right. Great. And your job? A uh, systems analyst. Uh, but for the form, uh, I don't know whether it would count as professional or business or, or what. What do you think? Uh, OK, it's more like business. Mm, fine. And would you mind my asking about your salary or we can leave a blank? No, no, I don't mind. It's um, 40000 a year. Oh, thank you. Right. About your current watching habits, what would you say is your main reason for watching TV? Well, at work, I tend to read for information and what have you, mm. so I'd say that with TV, it probably just helps me relax and unwind. Fine. And how many hours a day, on average, do you watch TV? Hmm, not a lot, really. I should say just over an hour. You now have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 5 to 10. So what are the two main times of the day that you watch TV? Well, uh, a little around breakfast time, mm. and then it tends to be really late, um, 11 or even midnight, when I finish work. And what sort of programs do you go for? Some news bulletins, but I also really like to put my feet up with some of the old comedy shows. <laughs> Fine. And turning to the new channel... Which type of programs would you like to see more of? Well, I certainly don't think we need any more factual programs, like news and documentaries. I think we need more about things like local information, you know, uh, providing a service for the community. And in the same vein, perhaps more for younger viewers. You know, good quality stuff. Uh-huh. And if you had to give the new directors some specific advice when they set up the channel, what advice would you give them? I think I'd advise them to pay a lot of attention to the quality of the actual broadcast. You know, the sound system. People are very fussy these days about that. And in general, I think they ought to do lots more of these kinds of interview, you know, talking with their potential customers. Oh, I'm glad you think it's valuable. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. Good. OK. This will be a commercial channel, of course. But how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? Well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. I don't think we can complain about that, as long as they don't last for ten minutes each time. <laughs> Quite. And would you be willing to attend any of our special promotions for the new channel? Yes, yeah, I'd be very happy to, as long as they're held here in my area. OK, I'll make a note of that. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, um, I'd prefer not, except for the information about the promotion you mentioned. Can I have your name and address? Of course. Um, here's my card. Oh, lovely. And... Thank you very much for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yes, indeed. Um, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear a student welfare officer talking to a small group of students just before the beginning of term. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Uh, OK. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. My name's Elizabeth Reed, and I'm your assistant welfare officer. Uh, what I'd like to do now is tell you a little more about some of the, uh, the social facilities available on the campus and also to tell you something about what the town has to offer. As you probably know already, the Student Union Building is the main centre of social life here, as indeed it is in most British universities. The Union runs a weekly programme of events for all tastes. Oh, everything from discos to talks by guest speakers. Many of these events are fundraising activities for charities, which the Union takes very seriously. They manage the Students' Union paper shop, selling magazines and newspapers, as well as stationery, sweets and so on. Um, then, uh, let me see, oh, there's the ticket shop, where you can get some very good deals on, well, for example, coaches to London, or inexpensive charter flights, as cheap as you'll get anywhere, people say, or tickets for big pop groups playing here, or at other venues all over the country, or plays in London, oh, and we mustn't forget the Union Cafeteria and the big new diner. Um, uh, yes, D did you have a question? Uh, yeah, does the Union also provide help with any problems? I mean, advice on financial problems, for example. Or does the University provide that? Yes, the Union run their own advice service offering help with financial matters, uh, such as grants. I'm sure you realise anything medical should be discussed with the University Medical Service, which also has an excellent counselling centre. I think that was made clear yesterday. However, the union has its own officer who can give advice on legal problems. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, on to Radford. For a town of its size, Radford has some unusually good leisure and community facilities and has quite a good shopping centre with an interesting range of shops. As you go into Radford, there's a new, well, quite new, Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, that's on the outskirts at a place called Renton. Above the pool, there's a high-tech fitness centre. Are there any ice skaters here? No? Oh, pity. Uh, the facilities for ice skating are excellent. Well, uh, the new Metro Tower, right in the centre of town, has got an ice rink and a sports hall for squash, badminton, volleyball and several other indoor sports. And in the same building, there's a new cinema with six screens. Uh, then... Let me see. Um, in the main square, just two minutes' walk from the Metro Tower, there's the Theatre Royal, which often gets London productions on tour. And in the streets nearby, you can find a good range of inexpensive restaurants, including Indian, Chinese, Thai and Italian. That is the end of Part 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to Part 2. Part 3 You will hear a tutor, Dr Simon, talking to some of his students about writing a dissertation. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen to the discussion and answer questions 21 to 26. OK, uh, welcome back to the new term. I uh, hope you've had a good break and that you're looking forward to writing your dissertation. Uh, now, what I'd like to do in this session is give you the opportunity to ask questions on writing the dissertation. Uh, requirements, milestones, who to see when you need help. It's very informal. It may all be written on paper, but it's nice to get it confirmed. So, um, anything you'd like to ask? Uh, Dr. Simon, is there a fixed hand-in date yet? Uh, right. I can confirm that that's the 21st of May, not the 20th, as we first stated. OK? Um, Jane? What about the word limit? Well, we try to be pretty flexible on this, but in broad terms, it's 18 to 20,000. Ah. And you can choose your topics, anything from years two and three. Uh, yes? Uh, I still haven't got any idea what I want to do it on. Uh, who... Well, you should see your course tutor to um, uh, agree on your final title, and you should also be aware that there's a special programme running on research methods for anyone who wants some extra help on that. Uh, can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, look, uh, let me write it on the board. Uh, when the different stages have to be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic bibliography, and that's due into your course tutor by the 31st of January which is just two weeks away, so you'd better get a move on on that. Do we have to have our own draft plan by then? No, your draft plan is due on the 7th of February, which is a week later, so that should give you plenty of time. A and when do we have to be doing the research? That's over a one-month period, essentially February to March. And the write-up? Well, you can't really get going on your writing until you've got quite a bit of the research done, so that's really March to May, with the hand-in date on the 21st. Any more questions? Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about computers. Would you advise us to buy one? Yeah. What can I say, um, uh, Andy? Uh, I know it's a massive expense, but I really feel it would be of great benefit. You can always look in the student union adverts for second-hand ones. Um, yes? I I've been looking at some of last year's dissertations. Oh, is, is that a good idea, sir? I, I heard... Well, that. I don't think you should read them in detail too early, or you might end up taking more of their ideas than you realise. Um, but yes, it, it really is the best guide you can have to the um, uh, expectations of the um, of what's expected when you write a dissertation. Sorry, Jane, I interrupted you. No, that's OK. It's just that they did a lot of research using questionnaires. Is that a good idea? I think questionnaires are very good at telling you how people fill in questionnaires. Uh, but to be frank, they tell you very little else. Avoid them. Mm. Um, about interviews, is it OK if we interview you? The tutors? Well, uh, I don't see why not. They don't have any special contribution to make, but you can if you want. Uh, there's a whole section on this issue in the research guide. I'm afraid it's slightly out of date, and you're probably better talking to the tutor on the research methods course. But you might find it useful to start there. OK. Oh, thanks. OK, well, great. Uh, I hope that's sorted a few things out. You can always come and see me or drop me a note if you've got any more queries. Right. Fine. OK, thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4. You will hear a lecturer.
talking to a group of students at the beginning of a course in rural development. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. I hope that this first session, which I've called an introduction to British agriculture, will provide a helpful background to the farm visits you'll be doing next week. I think I should start by emphasising that agriculture still accounts for a very important part of this country's economy. We are used to hearing the UK's society and economy described as being industrial or even post-industrial. But we mustn't let this blind us to the fact that agriculture and its supporting industries still account for around 20% of our gross national product. This figure is especially impressive, I think, when you bear in mind how very small a percentage of the UK workforce is employed in agriculture. This is not a recent development. You'd have to go back to 1750 or so to find a majority of the workforce in this country working in agriculture. By the middle of the next century, in 1850 that is, it had fallen sharply to 10% and then to 3% by the middle of the 20th century. And now, just 2% of the workforce contribute 20% of GNP. How is this efficiency achieved? Well, my own view is that it owes a great deal to a history over the last 50 or 60 years of intelligent support by the state, mainly taking the form of helping farmers to plan ahead. Then the two other factors I should mention, both very important, are the high level of training amongst the agricultural workforce. And secondly, the recognition by farmers of the value of investing in technology. Now, although the UK is a fairly small country, the geology and climate vary a good deal from region to region. For our purposes today, we can divide the country broadly into three. I've marked them on the map here. The region you'll get to know best, of course, is the north, where we are at present. The land here is generally hilly, and the soil's thin. The climate up here, and you've already had evidence of this, is generally cool and wet. As you'll see next week, the typical farm here in the north is a small family-run concern, producing mainly wool and timber for the market. If we contrast that with the eastern region over here, the east is flatter and more low-lying, with fertile soils and a mixed climate. Average farm size is much bigger in the east, and farms are likely to be managed strictly on commercial lines. As for crops, well, the east is the UK's great cereal-producing region. However, increasingly significant areas are now also given over to high-quality vegetables for supply direct to the supermarkets. The third broad region is the West, where it's a different story again. The climate is warmer than in the North and much wetter than in the East. The resulting rich soils in the West provide excellent pasture, and the farms there are quite large, typically around 800 hectares. The main products are milk, cheese and meat. So, clearly, there are marked differences between regions. But this does not prevent quite a strong sense of solidarity amongst the farming community as a whole, right across the country. This solidarity comes in part from the need to present a united front in dealing with other powerful interest groups, such as government or the media. It also owes something to the close cooperation between all the agricultural training colleges, through which the great majority of farmers pass at the beginning of their careers. And a third factor making for solidarity is the national structure of the farmers' union, of which virtually all farmers are members. Finally, in this short talk, I'd like to say a little about the challenges facing farmers in the next century. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Improving English speaking skills involves a combination of practice, exposure, and active learning. Here are some strategies. 1. Practice regularly. Engage in conversations with native speakers or fluent English speakers as much as possible. This can be through language exchange partners, conversation clubs, or even online platforms. 2. Listen and imitate. Listen to English podcasts, watch movies, or TV shows in English. Pay attention to pronunciation, intonation, and common phrases, and try to imitate them. 3. Expand your vocabulary. Learn new words and phrases daily. Use flashcards, apps, or vocabulary lists. Practice using these words in sentences. 4. Work on pronunciation. Use online tools or apps that focus on pronunciation and accent training. Record yourself speaking and compare it to native speakers. 5. Engage in public speaking. Join groups like Toastmasters to practice speaking in front of others. This helps with confidence and fluency. 6. Think in English. Try to think in English rather than translating from your native language. This helps with fluency and reduces hesitation. 7. Take English classes. Enroll in courses or workshops that focus on speaking skills. A structured environment can provide guidance and feedback. 8. Be patient and persistent. Improvement takes time. So be patient with yourself and keep practicing consistently. Integrating these practices into your routine will gradually enhance your speaking skills.